So let's continue on to chapter two. In chapter two, you're looking at categorical variables. So at this point, it's very important you know what a categorical variable is. Make sure you've reviewed chapter one to understand the differences between variable types because every type of graphical display I'll be talking about here will be for categorical variables. So let's start with some nice and easy stuff. Let's start with some pie charts and bar charts. So we have the bar chart on the left and the pie chart on the right, both for displaying univariate categorical data. And in some ways, we might think the bar chart is easier to read. You can see the heights of the bars. It's also worth noting that this variable that I'm analyzing here is ordinal. This is an ordinal categorical variable. A variable can be ordinal and categorical. It's kind of like all people are humans but not all humans are male. So male is the ordinal, as in all ordinal variables are categorical, but not all categoricals are ordinal. It's like categorical is the blanket statement like humans is, where ordinal is the, the inside, the inner like diving down deeper. So you can have an ordinal variable and it's categorical. All ordinal variables are categorical, they just are a categorical variable that has ordinal order to it. Um, side note, if it doesn't have order, it's called nominal. So you don't need to know that, but a little side note there. So these are ordinal categorical variables, and you can see the relative frequency. And now I can change it from the relative frequency. Let's make a little change over here and make this one not a relative frequency by putting in the counts there. So now this is a frequency. A frequency just shows the counts. So this is a pie chart with frequency, and this is a bar chart with relative frequency. These are both univariate categorical displays of data. But there is a one more we have that's really similar to the bar chart. Here we have the Pareto chart, and this is very similar to the bar chart. It's just a bar chart that has been put in order. Even for this ordinal variable, we don't see that order on the bottom anymore because a Pareto chart will put it in order. Pareto, put it in order. You'll notice on the left, we have a cumulative frequency, and on the right, we have a cumulative relative frequency because it's relative to 100%. The bar shows us just the cumulative as it goes up, and we could actually use this to not do a cumulative frequency or not do a cumulative relative frequency, just looking at the relative height of one of the bars. This right here, liberal, looks to be about 10%, and that looks to be around 100 people. There was right around 1,000 people in the survey. Makes the numbers nice and neat. Once again, a frequency on the left and a relative frequency on the right. So a Pareto chart is, or a Pareto plot, Pareto chart, same thing. They are used to display univariate categorical data. Going back, our next objective is to be able to calculate relative frequencies, marginal distributions, and conditional distributions. To do this, we actually need to look at either a frequency table or a contingency table. So let's look at a contingency table since that's a little bit more complex. Here we see the contingency table and the mosaic plot. Now, I always say the contingency table and mosaic plot are best friends. They go everywhere together. They analyze bivariate categorical data. And you'll notice this, that if you take this, I'm going to like flip it up, turn it 90 degrees this way, you'll notice no, yes, other, and yes, social go to the bottom. Remember, we're just turning this 90 degrees counterclockwise, and then no and yes go to this side right here. So not necessarily that side, but the other side. So there'd be no and yes over here. And you can kind of see that if we were to add up 592, that would be the group in here. That's because no is now pointing up down. You gotta kind of turn it in your mind a little bit to see this. And 56 is right here. And 367 is the people in yes social. So kind of know what you're looking at, make sense of it, because you'll be using tables like this most likely on the test. So looking at this right here, when we talk about all the things that can be done with this, there's so many questions. We can ask you, given somebody has student loans, what's the probability they're in Greek life? And so you only would look at given someone has student loans. So we'd look at yes, given someone has student loans, what's the probability they're in Greek life social? So we'd look in the yes right here, 
So given someone has student loans, what's the probability they're in Greek life social? And this is not 32.43 because that would be for this row. It says row percentage right here, so that's within this row. If we had column percentage, you actually could get the answer here because there's a column right here. But these are not the percentages. So always look to see what this is talking about. This is the row percentage. If you notice, the rows add up to 100%. So we could ask questions like, given someone is not in Greek life, what's the probability they have student loans? And that would be 49.32% by taking 292 over 592. Um, lots of questions can be like, for all students, what's the probability student, they have student loans? And since it's for all students, uh, 1015 and 436, so 436 over 1015. Now, when you get these questions, my biggest advice is, is to circle the numbers and underline the parts of the sentences that are detailing to you what you might need to circle. For all students, I would circle that. What is the probability that they have student loans? That's what I would circle too. And the other one, given someone has student loans, I would circle that because that's going to help you find what number you're looking at. For all students who have student loans, what's the probability they're in Greek life social? And so I would circle that I need to go to student loans, yes, and it's this group right here, and then look within it. So I'm looking at 119 over 436, and that's about 23%. Uh, you can figure it out on your own, but lots of ways to do that. So this is conditional distributions right here. Now when it gets to the marginal distributions, the marginal distributions are literally the distributions in the margins. And it's a univariate display when you think about it, because the marginal distribution for Greek life is just this right here. The marginal distribution for student loans is just this right here. And you can see in the mosaic plot, because the width at the bottom is the marginal distribution for Greek life. You can see that there's very few Greek people in Greek life other, lots of people in Greek life social. And yeah, this is the marginal distribution right here, and it matches up to the numbers right here. Uh, on top of that, we have the marginal distribution of whether or not students have loans, and it's right here. You can see most students do not have student loans, yay for them. And you can see that matches up with 579 and 436, and those are the numbers that match up here. So the distribution on the right is the marginal distribution of the y variable. Down here is the marginal distribution of the x variable. It can be found in both the contingency table and both the mosaic plot, and it's just a univariate view. Inside the table, inside the mosaic plot, is the bivariate view. Now, the mosaic plot is excellent for letting us see whether or not there is a relationship between these two categorical variables. And I picked one where there is a bit of a relationship. The more uneven these blocks are, the more of a relationship there is. Because you're looking at changes in x, would the y levels be different? And if you notice here, when we go to yes social, they are less likely to have student loans. The no is bigger. Where we're in here in no for Greek life, the yes is bigger. So you can say that there is a greater likelihood for people who are not in Greek life or in Greek life other to have student loans, where people who are in Greek life social are less likely to have student loans. Thus, I think there is some sort of dependency or relationship or association between these two variables. And those are all synonymous words. There's a relationship, there's a dependency, there's an association between these two variables. I believe there is. Um, we haven't proven anything. We're just seeing if there's evidence. And the more these blocks are uneven, the more evidence there is. And I kind of have a weird test that I made up. I often say, would it hurt my feet to walk across that or would it damage my car? So if you see little like this one right here, if this was the only deviation we saw, like if these two blocks were the only ones and we saw this, I'd be like, nah, that's not much. But once you get into the realm of this big of a bump, that's where you're like, whoa, that's gonna, you know, I better be careful. I don't want to pay for the car repairs on that. So um, that's kind of my test for doing it later on. Just for a quick note, very quick reference. There is a statistical test for this and it does involve p-values and there, there it is down there. So there is an actual statistical test, but that is for a later day, way later in the class. For now, just see how uneven the blocks are. And the more unevens they are, uneven they are, that means that changes in x have different y responses. And that would mean some sort of dependency. Good luck with this chapter and email me if you have questions.